Dear colleagues, dear friends, it's my pleasure to initiate this first webinar of the school-based ENS section. Good afternoon from Brussels. And we have with, with us several lectures that will be very interesting on vestibular schwannomas. You will first listen to the lecture of Jan Frederick Cornelius and then of Marcos Tadagiba. And Sebastian Frölich and myself will moderate this very interesting session. But first of all, I would like to present the different activities of the school-based section. The section started two years ago. I have the pleasure to chair this section and there are very active board members. Munsef Beruma, Luigi Cavallo, Jan Frederic Cornelius, Roy Daniel, Sebastian Frölich, Emmanuel Joano, Tonstein Meling, Mahmoud Messerer, Dimitris Paraskevopoulos, and Idoya Zaspe. We have many activities. The first activity is to organize the school-based session of the EINS Congress, which is now an e-meeting. And the school-based session will be organized and I invite you to participate on Monday, 19 October at 5 p.m. You will have the opportunity to listen five very interesting lectures. The school-based section, as you have already seen, publish several newsletters with very interesting topics. If you are interested to participate to the newsletter to send some words, do not hesitate to contact me. I, I will give you just afterwards my email address. We've already seen recently a case discussion. I hope that you enjoyed this case. It took a lot of time to organize this. There are surveys linked to the case discussion, you have received the result of the, sur the, the survey and the final discussion with the ENS School Based Board. I hope you enjoyed this initiative and of course you are all welcome to participate to such activities. Under the work and the supervision of Lausanne's team and especially Roald Daniel, several consensus papers have been written. The first on tuberculum cellae meningiomas, the second on quaniopharyngiomas, and the third one, the subject of this webinar on vestibular schwannomas. It is a very impressive work under the initiative of Lausanne's colleague with the participation of all ENS board members and very well-known experts in each field. Finally, the webinars, this is the first webinar of the school-based section and you will see that each month the webinar is organized on uh, very interesting topics. Next month, I will speak about vertebral artery surgery around the craniocervical junction level. Then you will have CP angle endoscopy, petrochival meningiomas, hemorrhagic complication during school-based surgery, craniopharyngiomas, tuberculum, meningioma, tuberculum cellae, paracellar tumors, clival cordomas, and finally, bilateral and unilateral telovera approach for four ventricular lesions. You see, very interesting topic, one in each month. Now I come back to today's webinar, a very interesting webinar on a frequent topic, which is vestibular schwannomas. And we have the chance to have with us Two people very well know it in vestibular schwannoma surgery will give us a lecture and Sebastian Furish and myself will make the moderation of the session. First lecture will be given by Professor Cornelius. I worked with him in uh, La Riboisière when he was a resident uh, between 2000 and 2009. Then he moves to Dusseldorf where he subspecialized in skull base and vascular neurosurgery, as well as craniocervical junction surgery, and he is now vice chairman of the department. Professor Tatagiba is chairman and director of the Department of Neurosurgery in Tübingen. He is well renowned and has a very strong experience in vestibular schwannoma surgery. I'm now chairman and director in UZ Brussels in Belgium, and Sebastian Furich, that you know all well, 
is chairman and director in La Riboisier Hospital in Paris. So I think we will have a very interesting webinar. If you have question, please put your question with the button question and answer. Do, do not use the chat button, it will not work, but only the question and answer button. So I will not stop to share my screen and I will give the opportunity to Professor Cornelius to start his lecture. Please, Yann. Yeah, is it okay for you? You must turn on the microphone. Can, can you see my screen? Yes, we see your screen. But oh, sorry. So, I, 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 no. so, um, uh, producing words, and I want to start this. Uh, series of uh, webinars with a talk about the vestibular schwannomas. So um, I, I structured the, the content in three parts actually. So in the first, I, I will talk some, uh, give some words about the ma different management strategies. So in the second part, we're going to uh, talk about uh, everything around surgery, preoperative diagnosis, surgery, and the postoperative management. Last part, I'm going to uh, talk a bit about the follow-up and the uh, rehabilitation. So I hope that at the end of the talk, you will be able to counsel your patients about the different treatment options for vestibular schwannomas. I hope you will be able to decide between the different surgical approach, very familiar with the retrosigmoid approach. And last not least, I hope you will be able to inform properly your patients about the rehabilitation possibilities. So as most of you know, the vestibular schwannomas are very slow growing benign tumors. Actually, they are the most frequent tumor in the CPA and the median age at presentation is about 60 years. So it, they are due to a biallelic dysfunction of the NF2. In NF2 disease, they typically, typically occur bilaterally. Some of them are cystic, about 20% of them. So when talking about the different management strategies, we first, what is a tumor size? So there is a consensus that the tumor size is defined as the largest diameter outside of the um, internal acoustical metal, and uh, that it is measured on an axial MRI with gadolinium. But you have to keep in mind that the 5% planimetric change corresponds to a, about 20% volumetric change. So this said, if we look at a Danish registry, which is a very large registry, over 2,500 patients, they define growth as being more than three millimeters per year. So about 30% of the vestibular schwannomas grow with this definition. Other, other groups defined a growth over two millimeters or a volumetric change of 20%. So vestibular schwannomas have a growth rate from, or about 30 to 60% of vestibular schwannomas grow during the natural history. So before going into the uh, different um, contemporary treatments, we, I think we have to honor the, the fathers of uh, this uh, type of surgery. So having Kashi started operating bilaterally and uh, with a subcapsular dissection technique, 
and then later Walter Dundee, he did a unilateral but a, a gross total resection and Lars Lexel in the 60s introduced the stereotactic radiotherapy for this type of tumors. So looking at the mortality at the beginning of the um, 20th century, it was enormous, it was over 80%. And uh, with Cushing's work and uh, his, uh, his techniques, he brought it down um, be below, below 5%. And after him, Dandy, who was a bit more radical, had a, a mortality rate of about 11%. The technical milestones, I think the most important ones is, was the introduction of uh, electrosurgical generators. So you can see here Cushing and William Bowie in 1926 in, in Boston using the first electrosurgical generator. Then I think the introduction of the operating microscope by Hitzelberg and Haus in the beginning of the, in the early 50 years. And uh, last not least, the introduction of neuromonitoring techniques at the end of the 70s. So electrosurgery, microsurgery, and neuromonitoring are very important technical adjuncts to this type of surgery. So how, how do we do it today? I think it's important the, the um, thought of teamwork. We are closely working together with our ENT colleagues, I think on a daily basis. And we, we every, every, every aspect of the pathology, so the pre- and post-operative diagnosis, the tumor board discussions, we usually perform surgery uh, to two surgeons, four hands, two brains, so all approaches. And of course, you have to have a, a very good uh, neuromonitoring, a neuro-ICU, and uh, ideally a radio surgery on site. And you have, I think we also rely on the physiotherapy, psycho-oncology, and a good outpatient clinic. So all this, I think, are the prerequisites to, to uh, um, offer and present a high standard of care. About management uh, for the small and the medium-sized vestibular schwannomas, it's a um, very difficult or complex discussion because you have a lot of valid uh, options and possi possibilities. So as it, it's uh, only sl slow growth, one to three millimeters per annum, and uh, you, you may adopt uh, at the beginning a wait and scan strategy. However, the growth behavior is individually unpredictable. So, and the other thing is that there will be probably in almost all patients a progressive hearing loss over the time. So the second option is radiosurgery. So radiosurgery offers a high tumor control. You have a very high rate of immediate hearing preservation. However, you also have a progressive decline over time. So about 60% at five years and 10, uh, 40, 40, 45% at 10 years. When considering surgery, and I'm at the moment talking for the small and medium uh, tumors, so you have a possible cure and a long-term hearing preservation. So, and the better the hearing is preoperatively, the better the outcome will be. So this is kind of um, complex um, discussion between many, many options. So when we consider the large vestibular schwannomas, the discussion is more easy, so it's uh, um, the, 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 the treatment modality of choice is, is surgery. However, there are different uh, techniques, approaches, and there are also different strategies con considering um, the radicality of surgery. So this is, uh, these are the data of the um, paper that was uh, already mentioned by Mikael. So it's a pool, it was a pooled analysis and for pu uh, gross total resection, the facial nerve preservation rate was about 60%. Hearing preservation at best 55, and the regrowth rate about 9%. For the subtotal resection, the facial nerve preservation rate was higher. Hearing preservation was better, but we had a very, or there, there was a um, higher regrowth rate. So the combined 
strategy of doing a subtotal resection and radiosurgery had, had a um, facial nerve preservation rate of 95%, a medium hearing preservation rate, and a 5% regrowth rate at three years. So it seems that this combined strategies may be the, um, the, 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 the strategy of choice for large or giant aneurysm, uh, sorry, vestibular schwannomas. So when talking about the different surgical approaches, there is no superiority of one approach over the other. So um, we have the retrosigmoid approach. I think it's the um, most um, common and uh, to, uh, most known to um, every neurosurgeon. So you, uh, you, you are able to uh, resect tum tumors of any size. It's possible to obtain a hearing preservation and uh, you have good brainstem control, good artery control. You need some cerebellar retraction, some drilling. You have excellent anatomic landmarks. However, it's a bit uh, laborious to do the positioning. So in comparison, the middle fossa approach is well suited for small tumors in the internal uh, acoustic mertus. Um, it's possible to preserve hearing. So the, the brainstem control, artery control is, is not, uh, not interesting in the small tumors. You need some, some kind of temporal retraction. Sometimes you need lumbar drainage. So you need to, to, to drill. It's very helpful to have a navigation because the anatomic landmarks are not, not so good as, for example, in the retrosignalit approach and positioning is not an issue. And you have the translab approach so also suited for every size of tumor. However, you, you will not be able to preserve furring. So this is, um, I think, the, the, most, uh, the biggest disadvantage of this approach, of course. And however, you have a very good um, facial nerve control. The approach to the brainstem is perpendicular, and it may be difficult to control arteries in the depth of this small um, approach. You need no retraction of the cerebellum, and you have easy access to the, to the CSF. You need a lot of drilling. Anatomic landmarks are good and easy, and uh, positioning is not an issue also. So what about the different modalities for radiotherapy? So you have the stereotactic, or you have the hyperfractionated stereotactic uh, radiotherapy, which is delivered in three to five fractions. And this recent paper found no significant difference between these different um, irradiation modalities. So if, if we, we want to summarize what we have said, so in the small and medium vestibular schwannomas, it's, um, it's a matter of which modality to choose, so a weight and scan strategy or radiotherapy or maybe even surgery. And for the bigger or large vestibular schwannomas, it's uh, clear that it goes to surgery and, and then you have to think about the type of approach you want to take and how radical it should be. So we have briefly um, seen the retro with the middle force and the translab approach. So it's, uh, there's no superiority of one approach to the other and uh, probably a subtotal resection with a radio surgery um, is, one of a, is, 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 is a very good treatment strategy. So when planning surgery, we uh, want to have an M MRI. So we have T1 with um, contrast enhancement, T2 and cis sequences, and we're going to look at the tumor size, the extension, if there's brainstem contact or compression, hydrocephalus, how the vessels and the nerves are. We look at the sigmoid sinus and at the cochlear signal. CT, we usually use a thin layer CT of the petrous bone to have a look at the, canal, the semicircular canals, um, also the sigmoid sinus and the pneumatization of the mastoid. If you're doing middle fossa approach, then you will need also CT for navigation. So some just Ill illustrative um, examples. So here is a T1 with a um, with contrast enhancement, so you, you see the, 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 the tumor here, you have the same uh, with the uh, T2 images, so we see the signal of the cochlea and the labyrinth. 
so you can do pre and po post operative comparison. So here you see a, an MRI at three months with residual um, enhancement along the um, vascular nervous bundle. So if you have a closer look at the T2 uh, images, you, you may see the nerve exit zone, you may see the, the ICA, and you can, um, you can analyze how the tumor brainstem interface is. So if you're looking at the um, extension laterally within the canal, so you will have Sometimes you notice that there is an extension here to the cochlea, and this is a bad predictor for um, hearing preservation if there's already some tumor growing into the cochlea. Here you have a T2, so on the left side you have a black cochlea, which is also um, a bad predictor for, for hearing preservation. So at first glance, you don't see anything, but if you have a closer look here with the T1 with gadolinium, you, you may see an intracochlear schwannoma. So the canal is free, but if you have a closer look, you may recognize this small intracochlear schwannoma. So as I said, the CT is um, important for um, planning the drilling. So we, we look at the posterior semicircular canal and here is an example of a perimetral air cell. So if you're going to drill here, you, you may create um, uh, um, uh, 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 a CSF leak. So, so if, if, if you have this type of configuration, you have to plan for, um, for closing the metal cells after drilling. Preoperatively, you will do some functional testing. So we are testing the facial nerve hearing. So we do this uh, together with our, our ENT colleagues do it for us. And uh, it's a, an advantage to do it on site because you, you may repeat um, uh, tests which were done in an ambulatory setting and you have more um, test mortalities than usually you have in an ambulatory setting. So the facial nerve uh, function is classified with a House and Bregman classification. So grade one and two is a good grade, a good facial nerve function. So the um, House and Bregman grade three is an intermediate um, uh, grade. However, it's uh, still important because patients usually are able to close their eyes. So this is an important feature in patients that were operated. And the uh, grade four to six are um, poor grades. So good facial nerve function is usually de defined as a house and Bregman grade one or two. So for hearing, hearing classification, so there are two systems, the AAO and the Garner and Robertson, Robertson and uh, a good, um, he a good uh, hearing is defined by the 50-50 criterion. So what does this mean? 50-50 is in, in both classification systems, a speech uh, discrimination of more than 50%, and um, a loss in the audiogram of uh, less than 50 dB. So here's an example of good hearing on the, on the right side. And uh, here you have a, an example in the audiogram of a loss of about 80, 70 dB. So this is an example of um, poor hearing. So equilibrium may be tested by calor calorimetry, which is a very sensitive test for vestibular dysfunction, but you may also um, do the head impulse test. So this is an example of, the, um, of a head impulse test, which is um, testing the uh, vestibular ocular uh, reflex. So here this patient had a vestibular schwannoma uh, on his right side, and, and you see a discoordination between the, the head and the eye on this side, whereas, whereas on, the, on, the, on the left side, which was not uh, attended, it's, it's a normal exam. So before starting uh, to talk a bit more about the surgical approaches, I, I just want to recall very briefly some um, uh, anatomical features of this region. So we are talking about the um, cerebellopontine angle. So this is a ventral uh, surface of the brainstem, the basilar artery, 
And if we look at this magnification, so we have the flocculus of the cerebellum, choroid plexus, and here we have the seventh and the eighth nerve coming from the brainstem and the ICA loop. And which what is also interesting is, is to have a look at these tiny arteries which come from usually from the ICA and, and, and follow the nerves and go into the inner ear. So I think these uh, vessels are very important to, to consider if you want to, um, to, to have the patients here after surgery. So when the anatomy in the CPA is distorted by a tumor, it can take very um, um, unusual um, constellations. However, if you look at the inner ear, the anatomic, um, the, anato the, the topography is always, always the same and is very constant. So, so you have an anterior and a posterior compartment, which is divided here by the, the uh, a bony, the Bill's bar. So posteriorly, you have the inferior and the superior vestibular nerve. And in the anterior com compartment, you have here on top the facial nerve and below the cochlear nerve. So this constellation here in the lateral um, recess is, is always very constant. And it may be uh, uh, very useful if you're following the nerves back to the, to the brainstem to, to ide identify how they are coming out here at the uh, inner ear canal. So this is an interesting paper, I think, from the group of uh, Vienna Co's, and uh, it's dealing about the, um, the tumor size and tumor nerve relationships. And um, so it, he, they defined the, the, the tumor size with the Roman numbers. So here you have the um, uh, um, intramental tumor when it's a great out of the inner ear canal and then you have two subdivisions. If you have a grade three here, it, it takes co contact to the brainstem, and a grade four is a displacement here of the brainstem. So this uh, neural topography is um, noted with the uh, Arabic numbers. So here you have type one and type two, and uh, either the, the, the tumor is on one side, like here in the grade, in the type one, or the tumor is in between, so like here in the type two. So you have more complex constellations, the type three, and the point is that if you have this type of constellation, one or two, you may achieve a higher rate of hearing preservation than if you have these more complex types of nerve and tumor topography. So it's uh, important to to think about this, uh, I think, uh, during surgery and, uh, and even before. So now I, I want to um, go into the details of the RetroSIC approach, which is, I think, the uh, most used by our, in, in, in all, all the departments. Um, we do it uh, here where I work in Düsseldorf in the park bench position. We uh, fix the head in a Mayfield head holder and we put the table with some anti trendalen board. So what is very important is that the um, patient is securely fixed to the table because during surgery sometimes you, you, you may want to tilt the table or do some rotation. And another important point is here to have a, a, a role to keep the axilla, the brachial plexus and the um, axillary artery free. So what about the head position? So the head positions should be slightly with a ventral flexion and a contralateral rotation and a lateral inclination like in this schema. So if you have a lateral inclination, one advantage is that you to see the um, nerve exit root of the facial nerve here. And it's all, uh, also um, uh, more comfortable for you as a surgeon to work if, if this angle between the shoulder and the neck is wide. This is um, working ergonomics. So this is how the patient is installed. So with all the uh, intraoperative monitoring uh, in, on, on, on fixed on the head and in the face. So what are the, the landmarks? So this is, um, we, we take here the root of the zygoma and trace the line to the inion. 
So here we have a horizontal plane and then we have a perpendicular line going through the tip of the mastoid and usually here at the intersection is the asterion which is the, the point of uh, inflection between the transverse and the sigmoid sinus. So you want to, to, to have your skin incision here to um, target this region here. So this is from a cadaver. Sorry. So um, when, when, we, when we're doing the incision, we, 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 we can do a slightly curved incision or we can do a lazy S incision or we can do an uh, oblique incision. So of course there are different possibilities to, uh, to do the skin incision. And if you have a, a, a thin neck, so it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't really matter if, you, if you're doing here, your incision here, you have your uh, um, line of sight like this and here is the sigmoid sinus, so there's no problem. However, if you have a very thick neck, then it's an advantage to take the skin incision more obliquely going like this. How, why, why is that? It's uh, because then you're able to retract all these muscles here and you have an unobstructed uh, line of sight. Okay, so this is, I think, very important in the planning of the skin incision. So what about the asterion? So this is an anatomical study of the asterion and they looked um, how often the asterion was exactly over the sigmoid sinus. So in most of the cases, it's right over the sigmoid sinus. However, in like four or five percent, you have your asterion uh, above the sigmoid sinus. So if you're doing your first burrow here on the asterion and you're above the sigmoid sinus, you will end up supratentorially. So it's a good thing, like here in this uh, scheme, if this is the asterion, to have the first burr hole made a bit below the asterion and not exactly over the asterion. So you're sure that you won't end up uh, over the um, tentorium. So if you're doing the approach, this is um, here the uh, position of the first burr hole and then you may do a um, craniectomy or a craniotomy. Then you expose the transverse and sigmoid sinus and usually we, we, we don't, in, in surgery, we don't really expose all the sinus. I, I think it's uh, done also here for educational reasons. Usually it's enough if, if you just see a rim here of the sinus and, and then you're now that you are at the, at the good place. So then the dura opening is, doing, is done parallelly to the sigmoid sinus with uh, take up sutures. And then get, this gives you a view here. Um, so this is the left side, a view from the inside. And here is the acousticus, the, the post acousticus internus, the seventh and the eighth. Here is foram jugulare with the caudal nerves. So this gives you this type of view. So when looking inside, you, you have three levels of nerves and vessels. So here you have the top level is the trigeminous nerve with the su um, superior cerebellar artery and the uh, uh, superior petrosa vein, vein of dandy. Then you have here the, the middle level with the seventh and the eighth and uh, the ICA, ICA loop. And you have the lower level here with the lower cranial nerves and the pica. So now I, I would show you just some more bloody uh, pictures from, from surgery. So if, uh, if, if, if you open the, the, the mastoid cells, you uh, have to wax them immediately before proceeding. So we, we usually uh, do a wax in and then a wax out. So waxing the uh, cells um, before um, your opening and then checking um, after dura closure. So this is also very important is uh, to have a, a good CSF release. So you, you take a cottonoid which is irrigated and it goes slowly down into the, um, to the cistern and then usually it's enough to um, do a gentle movement with your bipolar forceps to open up and then you, you, you will just have to wait 20 or 30 seconds just for all the CSF to come out. And then you may uh, continue the opening of the achnoid with a, with a sharp dissection. 
So here is, um, you have to release first the, the caudal nerves. Here we already see the seventh nerve. And then we proceed to the medium level here with the seventh and eight and the ICA. So we release all this arachnoidia. So what about the retractor and the superior petrosa vein? So shall we use it? Um, are we allowed to, to cut it? So here's a paper from Janetta and the Pittsburgh group uh, from 1999 with the over 4,000 operations of the posterior fossa. And uh, they systematically cut the um, petrosa vein complex. So, and uh, when, when, when looking at their cerebellar uh, complication or their cerebellar injuries, they, they had uh, like 0.5, so a very low degree of uh, cerebellar injuries. And um, for them, the, the, the point was that it was the um, effect or the degree and the duration of the retraction. So that was a problem and not sectioning or not the petrosa vein. Here's a review from 2016. So they were uh, looking after the complications after cutting the superior petrosa vein and their, um, their conclusion was that they, even in a liter literature review, they didn't find a lot of ca catastrophic complications. However, they um, recommended to, to spare or preserve the petrosa venous complex whenever possible. And, we, I think we do the same. It's um, almost always possible to, to, to preserve it. I think it's, uh, in, it's not necessary to, to cut it systematically, of course. So um, for protection of our re retractor, we have here um, a rondo pad, we call it. It's, it's a collagen fleece and um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very soft. And this is uh, after its, it's removal after the rondo pad, uh, after several hours of surgery, and you, 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 you find a very, um, very healthy cerebellar surface. So it's, it's not sticking like with cotonoids or, or, or things and, and it protects your, um, your cerebellar surface from, from the retractor and the instrument. So it's, uh, we think it's very helpful. So um, when approaching here the, the tumor or the internal acoustic canal, uh, we, we, we try to avoid too much traction. Here's a superior petrosa vein. So we, we actively have a look at it. We, we, look where, we look it up where it is. And, and then we, um, we uh, during surgery, we try to avoid too much traction on this vessel. The same, we, we don't want to have um, a, a traction here along the axis of the seventh nerve. So we, we you, you, um, should put your blade here in, in a bit more oblique position so you don't have a direct traction here on the nerve. So this is just to illustrate the 400 techniques. So a lot of um, time at the surgery, of course, you can do it uh, by manually, but sometimes there are, um, there are some uh, um, steps where it's very helpful to have an, another, a third or even a fourth hand here to like in this example. And um, so when going and opening the uh, internal auditory canal, so we have uh, several landmarks here. This is a famous uh, tubing line. So I think maybe Marcos Tatajiba may comment uh, uh, at the end. Uh, and uh, if, if you stay uh, above this line um, with your dural flap, you're sure not to open here this uh, critical region where you have the endolymphatic sac. So you, you, um, you, you have a flap here, a dual flap, and then you um, may drill here this, this bone. You have, of course, to be uh, uh, cautious and have a lot of irrigation. So what about the length? So it's, I think it's uh, very easy to, to measure, measure the distance you're allowed to go in here. If, if, if you are having a, a look at the preoperative uh, CT, so you have a distance uh, Y and uh, intraoperatively you, you measure this distance from the, um, from the rim here, rim, sorry, of the petrous edge and that gives you a, a, an appreciation of how far you are away from the, from the canals. So how, how to cover this um, 
this uh, drilling zone. So this is a, an article from Japan. So they, 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 they made a dura flap and at the end of the surgery, they, they put the flap systematically over the nerves. So we, we don't do that. So um, as I mentioned, if we have a, an air cell opened, then we will box it. Or maybe if it's a bigger cell, maybe we will um, put some, uh, um, uh, some muscle with some fibrin glue, but we do not do this uh, type of flap systematically. So when dissecting the tumor, I think it's important to, uh, to know this um, notion or to have this notion of an intracapsular dissection. So you at the end, you want up to end with the arachnoid plane, which protects you or is still between you and the nerves and the arteries. So this is how it looks like at the end. So you look and check for the hemostasis. Okay, so this is a video about um, retrosigmoid case with all the steps put together. So it was a patient operated in 2017. He had a left-sided vestibular schwannoma, close grade three, so it was touching the brainstem, but not compressing or distorting the brainstem. So we put the patient in a park bench position, oblique incision, because he had a very thick neck. So we do usually do a craniectomy. So before starting resection, we check if there is a facial nerve on the dorsal sur surface of the tumor. And then we start with the debulking. So this is stimulation at the outside of the tumor capsula to locate the seventh nerve. And then we proceed with a sharp dissection. This was is a cuser. So and regularly we are checking for the course of the facial nerve. In the fifth nerve. So this is the final phase of dissection. Coagulation and opening of the internal auditory canal for the drilling. Lot of irrigation. So now this sharp dissection in, in the canal and we want to localize the facial nerve. So, and then it's, it's so here the seventh nerve, and, and then it's a kind of retrograde dissection. So we are coming from the canal retrograde to the brainstem and try to connect the side where we started with our dissection. So a lot of irrigation. So as we are operating in a park bench position, one disadvantage is that the um, the blood drones um, to the to the bottom, and so we we need a lot of uh, irrigation during surgery to to keep the operating field clear. So this is is if you're operating a semi sitting position or a sitting position, then you have, uh, do, do not have this uh, problem with the blood droning to the bottom.
Okay, and uh, I think the closure is, uh, is, is classical, so we do a, a running suture. We usually put tacho seal on the suture. We are waxing the mastoid cells, and then there are different um, possibilities to close the bone. Usually we do a craniectomy and use a palacos, and then you have to do a very tight sutures of the muscle, the fascia, and the subcutaneous and skin, and then a stereo bandage. So during surgery, our intraoperative protocol so is uh, a TVAR because we're doing neuromonitoring. We keep the systolic pressure between 100 and 120. We give the patient preoperatively mannitol, about one gram per kilogram, eight milligram of dexamethasone, and we are constantly irrigating the, um, the, the, the operating site with a nematope. And usually we do not put any lumbar drainage. So why nimotope? Nimotope has um, um, neuroprotective um, properties. So uh, this is, uh, is uh, of course, a very useful um, feature if you're operating on the vestibular schwannoma. And it also has a topical spasmolytic potential. So here, this is, um, is an artery which got spastic during surgery. And uh, after the topical um, application of nematop, the, the spasm could be released. So this is in paper, it's uh, um, the uh, intravenous um, applicated nematop, so it was a phase three trial, and uh, the, the, the orsus, it was a big trial, and the orsus also found uh, a neuroprotective um, properties of this, um, of this agent, nematop, given intravenously, and uh, so this, uh, we, we, we don't, do not do this in Düsseldorf, but we take nematorp um, topically. So this is of, of course another important um, factor of um, successful surgery is not only the, 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 the surgeon, but it's also the, um, the neurophysiologist. So we have multimodal uh, intraoperative uh, monitoring here with the EMG. And here we have, uh, for the long tracks, we have the SEPs and here the uh, acoustic evoke potentials. So usually there is, uh, we have a free running EMG, but we also can do a direct nerve stimulation. So this may predict the outcome of the facial nerve after surgery. However, sometimes uh, if, even if the, um, if the uh, facial nerve is intact, you may not uh, um, have a, um, uh, a reply because there, they may be just a temporary nerve block. So this is not, so there are some uh, positive negative um, indications. For the hearing monitoring, you have the auditory brainstem evoked response and the um, cochlear nerve actual potential. So the disadvantage here of these uh, brainstem evoked responses is that they take about three minutes to, to be um, averaged and to be strong enough to be measured at the site where we measure it. Um, the advantage here of the SNAP is that it's uh, much quicker. So you have like a, a real time information about the status of the nerve. So there, 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 there is a, was a here a small paper which claimed that uh, SNAPs were more re reliable, but there is no real big, um, big uh, randomized control trial, as I, as, as I know. And here for the long tracts and the lower nerves, so they, they have uh, MEPs and SSEPs, um, but we do only, we only do it if, if we have big tumor, large um, uh, tumor with uh, brainstem compression. So as, as I said, the uh, BIER, they take some time to, to be averaged. So um, uh, in our opinion, you don't have a lot of information during the surgery, but um, if you're doing studies or analysis, you, you, you hear in this paper, they looked at the different steps of a surgery and they recognized where they had problems here with the uh, neuro monitoring. So it was when the internal auditory canal was dis dissected, or here when the um, canal was drilled, or here uh, at several stages during the, the tumor surgery. 
So this is an example of a SNAP. So here the, on, on the left side, so the systematics of the surgery was, uh, is, was always the same here. So this patient, everything well fi went fine. And here in this um, patient here, up to here, the potential is, uh, is okay. And, and here, starting with the drilling of the internal auditory canal and the removal of the tumor in the canal, then you had here a loss of, of the potential. And this type or this kind of information with the SNAPS, you, you get it within 10 or 15 or 20 seconds. So how, 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 how do you measure it? So you can put here an electrode, uh, a ball electrode at, uh, on the cochlear nerve, and then you may record all the time during surgery. This another type um, of, 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 um, of, of measuring the, the facial nerve function. So here you have a regular probe, and this is a, um, a, a sucker. So it's isolated here, and it, uh, only the tip is um, electrical. So during surgery, you, um, you, you, you have your sucker here in your left hand, and if you're uh, um, stimulating through the tumor capsule, so if it's uh, thick enough, you don't get any signal. And uh, if you're go getting closer and closer and closer to the nerve, at some point you get some information. And the ad advantage over a regular probe is that you don't need to, to switch the instrument all the time, but you have your sucker anyway in, in your left hand, and then you have a um, possibility to stimulate uh, at uh, each time of dissection of the capsule. So another tool, an interesting tool, uh, is uh, the endoscopy. So at the end of dissection, um, sometimes if you, you, you're not sure if there is a remnant left, very laterally, you may have a look with the endoscope. And sometimes it's also um, helpful to identify uh, um, perimeter air cells if you don't see them by the, uh, by the microscope. So the clinical follow-up is usually um, three months and one year, if, if you did uh, perform the gross total resection, and then every two to five years. If you're doing a subtotal resection, you want to monitor a bit more closely. So after one year, a yearly check. And uh, for the um, stereotactic radio surgery or radio surgery, you will do it closely uh, during the first year and then every second year. So I'm coming to the end. So just some words about uh, um, reanimation. So I think this is uh, common knowledge for most neurosurgeons. So you have possibilities to um, do a. Um, but this was a, or is an interesting uh, a paper which was a recent survey, and uh, they 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 asked the patients operated in a uh, in a center if they were counselled about um, the possibilities. After, uh, after hearing loss or the, uh, the hearing rehabilitation possibilities. And eight, it turned out that 88% of the patients didn't remember or didn't or were not counseled about uh, hearing rehabilitation. So I think this is something that uh, we in our neurosurgical community should uh, stress more on. And um, there are different possibilities for hearing um, rehabilitation. So the cochlear implant, or the auditory brainstem implant. What is important is that if you are going to um, plan for a cochlear implant, you, um, you may be, um, or you, you should do this before doing actually the surgery because there are papers or reports that say that uh, the cochlea may obliterate after surgery. And if it's translaboratine or retrosigmoid, it doesn't matter. So it's it's a problem and there are like space holders which may be implanted during the time of surgery and, and then you keep the cochlea um, disobliterated and then you have the option maybe to, um, to operate or put the cochlea implant sometime later. Or even there are some strategies which, um, which uh, promote uh, sim simultaneous uh, um, cochlea implantation with the resection of the tumor. So it's, I think uh, we, we don't have enough time to go into all these details, but the point I wanted to make is that uh, it's uh, 
not only important to think about the facial nerve, but it's also uh, very important, of course, to, um, to think about uh, preservation of hearing. And um, so there, there, there are quality of life uh, studies. And um, so uh, hearing, of course, is uh, something which is uh, very important in these uh, surveys. And the equilibrium, vestibular dysfunction, is always uh, a very critical point. And um, we should uh, try and do very specific um, questionnaires. And uh, so it's important to do it also prospectively. Okay, so please let me conclude. So I think um, surgery or treatment of patients with uh, vestibular schwannomas is, is uh, real teamwork. So it's working together with the neurosurgeons, the ENTs, radio oncologists, and the goals that we are pursuing are first quality of life, then the functional preservation, and then the oncological control. So for the small and medium tumors, so we have the weight and scan strategy or maybe radio surgery or surgery. And for the large tumors, we have the possibility of surgery, maybe subtotal surgery with the radio surgery. Um, so in any case, we need to refine our, as we as a surgeons, we really need to refine our surgical um, techniques and promote the neurophysiological possibilities and we have to evaluate new treatment paradigms in prospective trials. So intended subtotal resection with a radius surgery or surgery and cochlear implant and this um, kind of strategies. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm hoping that uh, we will have the possibility to discuss or get some questions. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh for this well illustrated and complete overview on the topic. I propose now that we move to Tübingen. Marcos Tatabiga, we, who owns a great experience on the topic, will share with us his tips and tricks to improve surely our results when performing a vestibular schwannoma surgery. Please, Marcos. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, Cornelius must uh, close his presentation, otherwise I can't present my case. Yeah, <clears throat> if you are so kind and uh, yes, perfect. So uh, here we are. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to, to thank this uh, opportunity of the European Association of Neurosurgical Societies and uh, the skull based session, Professor Bruno, Professor Froelich, to organize this uh, fantastic uh, webinar. And um, I've been asked to uh, say something about our experience with these kind of lesions. And um, I thank uh, Dr. Cornelius for, for his excellent lecture covering almost all aspects of uh, vestibular schwannoma treatment. Uh, I would like to focus more on surgical aspects. We are neurosurgeons, we are a neurosurgical society, and, um, and uh, that's the reason I, I would like to focus more on uh, some particular aspects of, uh, of surgery of these tumors. In the next, I guess, 15 minutes, I would like to share with you some uh, tricks and tips uh, I have accumulated in the last 30 years dealing with these lesions. As you may know, I've spent 16 years uh, working with Professor Majid Sami in Hanover. At that time, he was um, um, mastering these uh, kind of lesions, kinds of surgeries, and we had sometimes two, three cases every day. And uh, I got the opportunity to see and later on to do uh, many of these cases. And uh, during my period at the Hanover Medical School, I had opportunity to work with the ENT department and to have some experience with uh, middle fossa and translab approaches. But I've learned over uh, time that uh, I could do with the retrosigmoid approach everything that it's uh, necessary for these lesions. I, I actually, I don't need any longer 
middle force or translab approaches. I have no disclosures. And I would like to uh, start with this simple case, simple but sometimes a uh, uh, topic for discussion because this is a young patient with a small vestibular schwannoma and uh, these cases um, um, are very much discussed whether we should go for weight and scan, surgery, radiation and so on. Particularly, I'm, I'm on the opinion that if we are confronted with such a small lesion, um, we uh, shall wait first until we have the proof that this lesion is growing. Uh, once we have this confirmation, if the patient is old, um, it's our policy to send the patient for radiation. But if the patient is young, we go for surgery because we believe that the major goal uh, of treatment of these lesions, these benign lesions, is cure of the disease and keeping quality of life of patient. And uh, we have learned that for small tumors, functional results in surgery are very much competitive with the results of radiation. We can achieve the same result, functional results in, in small lesions and giving young patients a longer period of tumor control. So this is uh, just to start saying that um, goal of treatment must be uh, control of the disease and uh, keeping quality of life. If it's possible, cure of the disease. That means for young patients with small growing tumors, uh, my recommendation is surgery. But reality is, uh, is different. These are the tumors we are confronted with. Uh, sometimes very difficult tumors like these ones or tumors with very irregular shapes. Although this tumor is a little bit uh, um, similar to this one in terms of size, it's completely different because this tumor is not growing into the internal auditory canal and this is doing that, it's very irregular. So in this case, we have a realistic chance of even preservation of hearing and uh, whether in this case here, we must fight for the facial nerve. Neurofibromatosis too is a completely different situation. We are not going to deal with this disease today. Uh, maybe this is a topic for another webinar organized by this skull based session. This is the experience we have accumulated in the last 16 years here in Tübingen. Uh, now approximately 1,500 tumors operated, all of them with retrosigmoid approach. As I told you, I have learned that retrosigmoid approach can replace middle fossa and, uh, and translab approach in nearly all cases. We have another 300 cases we are uh, following up with a weight and scan, or we have sent to radiation for different reasons. So we learned that uh, for small tumors, supine position is sufficient. And for larger tumors, semi-sitting position would bring some advantage. So I'm just telling our experience. Later on, we can discuss this. I know that there is a lot of uh, debate on this topic. But I, I think the, uh, there is uh, some revival of the technique with center sitting position, but the way we do it is keeping the leg uh, slightly above the level of the head so that the risk of air embolies is nearly zero. So advantage of semi sitting position, we have published this together with our uh, nimodipine group. <clears throat> Um, this, uh, this is a comparative study, semi-sitting position with, uh, with supine position. And we have seen that both um, uh, tumor control, that means total tumor resection, and also functional results of facial nerve are better using semi-sitting position in comparison to supine position. And uh, in our... Um, group here with uh, more than 800 semi-sitting position done for different kind of pathologies. We have seen in no single case uh, 
severe air embolism that would uh, put the patient under risk. We see bubbles uh, in half of the cases, but in no single case, this has been a, 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 a problem for the patient. This is the reality if we use this technique, putting the leg uh, above the level of the head. So, um, what I have learned is that uh, craniotomy is extremely important. As uh, uh, Dr. Cornelius has presented to you, doing a correct retrosig craniotomy is the beginning of everything. If the craniotomy is wrong, your surgery will be much more difficult. And the correct way to do this craniotomy is exposing just to the edge of the transverse and sigmoid sinus. You don't know, need to skeletonize the sinus, but please go up to the sinus. Otherwise, you have a lot of uh, cerebellum in front of you and your retraction must be more than gentle resection, uh, retraction. And uh, it's not necessary to open the foramen magnum. However, you must open as much bone as necessary to have a direct view to the inferior part of the cerebellopontine angle. If you have a lot of bone here, you are not visualizing well. Why? At least, at least in semi-sitting position, one of the advantages is your angle of attack. You are approaching this lesion from inferior to superior, from below to above. That's the reason this uh, resection of bone is so important. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Cornelius spoke about the, the petrosal vein. Yes, the petrosal vein, in our opinion, um, uh, sh shall be preserved if it's possible. Whenever possible, we try to preserve it. And we put the retractor, as you can see here, we retract a little bit more inferior than superior to protect the vein. And our approach is from inferior to superior so that we have this window here. We work on this window and not on this one. And the advantage is we are going to see the lower cranial nerves very early and we can dissect the facial nerve from below easier than if we are coming from above. So that means these are the first uh, recommendations I can give to you. And we open the Jura in a one single uh, line. We don't do additional cuts. I don't do a flap. If you do just a simple incision, this is absolutely necessary to enter the cerebellopontine angle and it will make your Dura closure must, much faster and safer. And uh, for tumors like these growing very much up to the foramen lushka, if you are coming from below, you, uh, uh, your, your dissection is, is much easier. I have seen some people using the translab approach just because of this configuration of the tumor. This is not necessary. You come below the cerebellum, close to the tonsils, and you are going to expose this area very easily. So, once you have opened the dura, opened the cistern, then you can identify the uh, anatomy of the dura. It has been mentioned, the so-called tubing line. Tubing line is the line where all these dura rings are ending. You see exactly on this point. And this area will represent the inferior border of the internal auditory canal. If you cut the dura like here, you are always coming to the internal auditory canal, and there is no risk that you enter the foramen, the jugular foramen, or you go superior to the internal auditory canal. We start with a diamond drill of three millimeters, then we change to two and one millimeter as, as soon as we have exposed the canal, and we try to open 180 degrees and uh, to avoid bony area hindering our view from behind. If the patient has no hearing, we can open the entire canal like in translab approach. If the patient has hearing, we open just seven millimeters and we keep the, um, we keep the, the semicircular canals intact. 
So here, cutting the dura at the level of the tubing and line, uh, dura resection, open the canal. This is our first step. I have learned that opening the internal auditory canal first will make your surgery easier. You can identify and control the facial and the cochlear nerve from the beginning on, and at the end, when you are coming from the brainstem closer to the meatus, uh, you just need to come back to internal auditory canal, and then you have uh, easily uh, you, you can easily remove the last part of the tumor. I will show to you later on. So now here dissecting the tumor out, and uh, as I told you, in order to avoid injury to the semicircular canals and produce hearing loss we open just seven millimeters. And the last part we can observe with the use of endoscope. This technique of endoscope uh, with the retrosigmoid approach will replace completely the middle force approach. The advantage of middle force approach, that is you have a directly access to the uh, fundus, uh, this advantage disappears when you have uh, uh, the endoscope associated with the transmeatal approach in, in retrosigmoid route. Uh, you can see the fundus uh, at, the same, at the same way. So, um, very short here, you see we have uh, this situation, large tumor, this is in, in sitting position. Uh, and then the first step is to open the internal auditory canal, uh, dissect uh, these, and as first step, and then we can dissect the structures. We can identify the facial nerve above and the cochlear nerve is below and uh, under electrophysiology as, as has been mentioned. And uh, this as first step, almost always, only in, in giant tumors where the tumor is really blocking the internal auditory canal, we start with the bulking first. And then you see the lower cranial nerves, very early identification because we are watching from below to above. And uh, the advantage of Schwannoman is there is no nervous structure inside. You can go very quickly with your cavitron, ultrasound aspirator, and then we hold the tumor with one hand and with the other hand, we can dissect the structures. This layer is composed by arachnoid sheath and also perineural uh, structures. So if you, uh, we almost uh, don't use bipolar. I've learned that bipolar is really a poison to the nerves. Uh, if we use bipolar, we may damage the nerve uh, with hyperthermic uh, water and, uh, and we, don't, we don't control it, we, can, we can't control it. So I almost don't use bipolar, I use a lot of irrigation and nerve dissections. So uh, using this technique, we, we can come very uh, good forward. This is uh, a case of a small schwannoma. We uh, use the supine position for these cases. There is no need for, um, for a semi-sitting position, uh, but we open pretty much the uh, systems below in order to have a, uh, also an inferior approach to these structures. But you see the, uh, the angle of attack is a little bit different. Uh, using the supine position, we go directly to the internal auditory canal to the nerves. When we use the uh, semi-sitting position, we come from below to above. And I've seen that this is of particular advantage in, in large tumors. So I go a little bit faster here and uh, we do debulking and, uh, and then we do uh, dissection of the, of the nerves, of the structures. Um, here, you see, as soon as the nerve has been debulked, then we use the same technique. Uh, what I do is I put an aspirator on this area. This aspirator is, is uh, all the time there is placed with our uh, with our Lila uh, uh, retraction, 
and then uh, the assistant is irrigating and I can use both hands to dissect uh, the nerves and these structures. You see, Petrosa nerve is preserved. This case had a hydroglobulb. I had to skeletonize the hydroglobulb in order to come to the internal auditory canal. This is also possible. And then we use the endoscope to make sure that everything is well removed or to detect uh, any remnant that we have to remove. This is one advantage of endoscope. The other advantage is to detect any opened air cell like this one that you cannot see under the microscope. And if we have uh, detected, then my technique is to close it completely with bone wax first under direct endoscopic visualization. And then in addition, I put muscle and fibrin glue. So this is the technique we use. Uh, this is another case, a little bit larger, a lawyer who uh, wants to get married and have children and uh, decided not to go for radiation because she was very young, had still hearing, and she, she want to have a tumor, well tumor control, be cured from this disease. So we uh, agreed uh, to operate her under this condition to try maximal tumor removal and uh, trying preservation of function. So here you can see some tumor remnant uh, under the endoscope. And then we removed that part and continued. So as I told, first internal auditory canal and then uh, debulking of the tumor on this area and then dissecting these structures. So as you can see, the advantage of sitting position is that you don't have blood in your view. You can irrigate this area, you have clear view, then you can use your hands to hold the tumor and dissect uh, the structures. It will make, uh, in, in my opinion, it will make the surgery uh, more comfortable and uh, a visualization will be better. And uh, when we were finished, I checked it again and I detected these air cells here. Again, I had to close it with bone wax first and then put some muscle and fibrin glue. So this lady recovered very well. And uh, let's continue here. Yes, she got uh, a good face and uh, some hearing preservation after surgery. Uh, I, will, I will skip this case. This is a larger tumor with a uh, um, um, patient had very good hearing before surgery. We, I could remove the tumor almost completely. There is a small remnant you can see here. And this small remnant was necessary in order to keep the hearing preserved. It was, uh, it was a near total removal, but this small remnant is being well under control. This is now uh, five years since surgery and uh, there is no growth so far. If it's growing, we are gonna send her for radiation. Sometimes even in large tumors, we have very good hausen breckmann result as in this case as well. You can see here large tumor, immediate good facial function, also in this case, also in this case, but this is not uh, the reality in all cases. We do have a uh, functional deterioration after surgery, like in this case here, but in my opinion, this is not a reason uh, to avoid uh, gross total removal or near total removal. Uh, this is, um, these are uh, results, long-term results in, in 576 cases of vestibular schwannomas. You can see here that immediate of this is pre-op, patients had House Breckman 1 in 96%, 4% House Breckman 2 before surgery. Immediately after surgery, more than half of the patients deteriorated somehow. But after three months, they recover pretty much well. And after 15 months, you see in, 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 in the general cases, we had 90% House Breckman uh, 1 and 2, 
and and about uh, uh, 10% uh, deterioration more than House Brackman 3. And, uh, and you see here, if we uh, separate the tumors into the different sizes, in, in T1, we got House Brackman 1 and 2 in all cases. This is very similar to results with the results of radiation. In uh, T2, we had 1% uh, House Brackman 3 after 15 months. You saw immediately after surgery, there is a great deterioration, but the patients will recover. Only in large cases, this recovery is not uh, complete in a number of patients. You see here, these are large and giant tumors. We had about 23% uh, uh, of uh, House Breckman uh, three or more in these cases. And all these patients here with these tumors, they deteriorated immediately after surgery to House Breckman four, immediate after surgery. Afterwards, they all developed House Breckman two. Very acceptable results in all these cases. And in this one, the all patients had immediately after surgery House Breckman 4. This is a very unpleasant phase, but over time they all recover to House Breckman 1 or 2. Also, very um, acceptable results. There are cases indeed, if the patient is coming already with some facial palsy, these patients are very much under risk to develop severe facial palsy. Then we must consider subtotal removal like this uh, young woman with a large tumor, hydrocephalus, some facial palsy. In this case, I did subtotal removal. Uh, she had deteriorated after three months. She had uh, House Brackman 3. Now she's developing uh, uh, something between 3 and 2. I do hope that she will be House Brackman 2 afterwards. Let's see. But this was the maximum we could uh, uh, achieve in her case. And of course, in old patients with large tumors, we don't send this patient with large tumors to radiation. I do partial removal, and then later on we can control or irradiate uh, these tumors. This is our policy in these cases. Why uh, we do it? Why are we not systematically uh, putting uh, subtotal removals in all these uh, larger tumors? Because we have seen in our series that if we do subtotal removal in uh, larger tumors like T3, in our series, 7.6% uh, uh, subtotal removal. And in T4, we had in 17.5% subtotal removal in order to preserve the facial nerve. This is, was the maximum we could achieve on these cases. But look at this. 40% of these uh, patients developed a tumor regrowth, where only 6% of the patients with T3 in our series uh, after growth total removal uh, developed uh, regrowth. Only 6% in comparison to 40% if we don't do uh, total uh, removal. In T4 tumors, uh, as I told you, we, uh, in 17.5% of the cases, we did subtotal removal. We couldn't remove completely. And in 36% uh, of these cases, there was regrowth in comparison to 2% after total tumor removal with this tumor size. And these results are pretty much comparable with the results published by Nakatomi in GNS 2017 showing that after uh, subtotal removals, the rate of regrowth is much higher than after growth total removal. So uh, in, in my opinion, we must do everything we can to learn the technique to improve uh, total resection while controlling function of the patient, of course, but we should not uh, systematically uh, recommend subtotal removals in all cases just because the tumor is large.
I guess in, in, in the majority of the cases, we can achieve total tumor removal. There are a, a number of patients, approximately 20% of the large tumors, uh, total removal would produce too much deficits on the patients, and then we have to do subtotal removal. But paying attention, that regrowth rate is much higher in these cases. So I guess this is what I would like to tell to you. I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I hope we can discuss these uh, lectures later on. Thank you. Your microphone is not on. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Tatagiba, for this uh, impressive talk. Uh, we will now move to Paris, and uh, we would like to listen to Professor Folish comments on the topic. We plan initially to have a 90 minutes webinar, but I think it will be a little longer. Please, Sebastian, do you have any comment, question to Jan or Marcos or me? Uh, first, uh, I enjoyed uh, very much both presentation. I think uh, you enjoyed it also. Jan, you did a fantastic overview of, uh, of the subject and, uh, and it, was, it was really, really nice. Um, about the, the surgical strategy, Marcos is one of the master in, uh, in schwannoma surgery. And uh, personally, I have followed his, uh, his techniques uh, for many years and uh, on the tip and tricks. I think uh, I am not using the sitting position, so it's, it's not very easy to apply uh, the principle of, uh, of Marcos Tatajiba in a, in a lateral position, but still uh, the principle that we should avoid traction on the axis of the fascial nerve, uh, the two pincet technique, one to grab the tumor away from the nerve, is, is extremely important. Uh, I think it's absolutely key to keep uh, fascial nerve intact and hearing any traction on the nerve, lateral to medial, medial to lateral, lateral whatever, is, uh, is, uh, is very bad. And this is definitely something I learned from uh, Marcos. Um, it was not, uh, you, you didn't, uh, uh, emphasize it uh, a lot in your presentation, but if I, if I may say that, I have the feeling that in your technique, you, you really dissect the tumor away from the nerve uh, from uh, up, down, but never in the long axis of the nerve. And, and this is extremely important. If you have a nerve like this, you can move it this way. But if you track in the axis of the nerve, then it's, uh, it's definitely very bad. So whatever is the position of the nerve, traction in the long axis should be avoided. And this is definitely something I learned from uh, Marcos Tatajiba. About the position, it's, uh, it's a very long debate. Uh, I have to say that personally, I use the lateral position and I'm happy with it. This issue with, uh, with bleeding is, is an issue. And, uh, and it's not because it's bleeding that we should use the bipolar. I completely agree that the bipolar should be avoided uh, in schwannoma surgery. So if you use the lateral position, you need also to be used to work in a kind of bloody environment with a very good assistance that suck in the good area and irrigates a lot. It's a forehand technique. You need a lot of irrigation to wash the blood, even more than with the sitting position, obviously. And uh, about the functional outcome, me, I have to say that my priority is the fascial nerve function. So I don't have the same results that uh, uh, Marcos Tatajiba presented. Uh, I'm more around uh, for, for a large tumor or, or giant tumor, I'm more around 40% uh, subtotal resection, something like this. Uh, I leave more remnants. But I disagree also with the fact that we should, from the beginning, I, I disagree with the strategy that uh, says we will leave a big piece of tumor because we want to avoid a, a fascial nerve paralysis. I think this is, uh, is dangerous and it's, uh, um, the risk is that we will forget that uh, the technique is important. And uh, just debulking the tumor 
tumor will grow definitely and radiation may not be always easy in a complex volume. If you leave too much tumor on the trunk, on the brainstem, on the internal auditory canal, along the nerve, above, below, it's not so easy to do radiation, I believe. I'm not a radiation oncologist, but I, had, I, I saw some, uh, some challenging situation with radiation because there was remnant uh, all around. So I think the technique is extremely important and, uh, and we have uh, uh, fantastic people to teach the good, the good points. Uh, but fascial nerve function now, nowadays is also extremely important. And, uh, and uh, leaving patient with a fascial on a complete resection, I think, is somehow a, a failure of treatment. So yes, it can recover, but sometimes not completely. So a complete fascial with a complete resection, the choice was, in my opinion, not a good one if this happens. Thank you very much. I agree with all points, all points you have said. Absolutely. This is... Uh, but it's a very demanding surgery. In my opinion, schwannoma is one of the most difficult tumor to treat in skull-based surgery because uh, it's a surgery uh, where mistakes are not forgiven. Yeah. A mistake means uh, a terrible outcome for the patient. And we always have to remember, and it's important for the young, uh, the young neurosurgeons that the patient with a schwannoma doesn't have a lot of symptoms. He doesn't complain much before the surgery. His life is not in danger. So it's, it's usually patients that will be very disappointed if they have issues post up. It's not like a cordoma patient where he knows that uh, uh, being cured may have a cost. But schwannoma patient, I don't know if you agree with this, Jan and Marcos and Michael, but it's, it's patients that have a difficulty to accept uh, complication functional issues post up. So it's a very demanding surgery for, for the neurosurgeon. Of course, the facial outcome is the priority in such yeah. surgery for a good quality of life. I listed Marcus opening the internal auditory canal at the beginning. I understood the end, it is more at the end. And you, Sebastian? And the, the second question is? I, was, I used to open it at the beginning. And uh, one of the fellows that was with uh, Marcos, I had the chance that she came to me. So I, I, uh, I learned from Marcos because of, uh, of, uh, of one of my previous fellow. And uh, now I open it from the beginning. If I, if I may say why I do it, uh, I think it's uh, very good because you decompress the fascia nerve with openings the internal auditory canal. So after having openings the internal auditory canal, opening the dura, you can manipulate the tumor with less risk and pressure on the cochlear nerve and fascia. Second point for me is that the, the cleavage plane, I find it at the level of the porous when you make an incision on the dura of the internal auditory canal. This is where personally I find the cleavage plane the best. Yes, these are good points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, uh, what uh, in my opinion is also interesting is that at the beginning of surgery, you are full of energy, you know, <laughs> and you are relaxed. And this is a good point to open it. And the tumor will protect the nerve structures. If you have dissect the nerves from the tumor, and then at the end, you have all these nerves swimming in your fluids. And if you start drilling the internal auditory canal there, it's more dangerous for the nerves. So if you start, if you do it at the beginning, there is no risk that you will damage nerves with this drilling procedure. And, and, and I, I don't like to stop my surgery, my dissection at the porous, and then start to drill and then to come back for dissection. So I do it at the beginning and then I don't need to stop the dissection. As uh, Cornelius showed very well in his uh, lecture, 
uh, that he dissects uh, the, the, the tumor away from the nerves up to the porous, and then he opens the porous and continue the dissection from lateral to medial. This is exactly what we also do, but we have the porous already opened. So when we come to this last part, I just go back to the internal auditory canal and continue the dissection. I, I don't like to stop my dissection to go <laughs> to, to drill procedure, you know? And uh, I, feel, I feel safer if I have at the beginning two more protecting the nerves. Uh, another point I think with uh, another advantage of opening the canal first is uh, devascularization of the tumor. Yeah. Because when you coagulate the feeders, I believe comes from mainly from the dura of the internal auditory canal and around the porous. And if you coagulate all this posterior part of the dura around the porous, you in fact devascularize the posterior uh, half of the, of the sphere of the tumor. It diminishes, yes. It, it, it reduces significantly. And sometimes you see on the dura that there is shunts, there is vessels, yeah. uh, dilated vessels on the dura. And the coagulation out of all this that you need to do to make your incision to have access to the, to the, to the bone to drill it is important. It's helpful, I believe. Yes. Uh, Franz, I received some questions and there is one for uh, Marco Statagiba. Can you re-explain a little the Tübingen line, please? Yes. Um, hmm. <laughs> Maybe I have to... <laughs> it's a direct, it's a direct question. <laughs> I, I can, I can uh, you can go back to our publication <laughs> in neurosurgery or I, I have to show again the slides. I don't know if... Uh, um, <laughs> So if you, I just, I will just explain. If you, if you open uh, the dura and you watch the, uh, the posterior part of the petrous bone, you will see that the inferior part of the dura covering the petrous bone, this dura is not very tightly attached to the bone. So at the inferior part, on this area, the endolymphatic sac is located. This less attached dura, uh, it ends at a certain level. And then it's <coughs> another type of dura, which is very much attached to the bone. Exactly on this interface, you will find the so-called duping and line. If, if you watch the anatomy, you will understand this easily. Uh, I don't know if I could uh, answer the question. Good, good. Yeah. And another question, can you again please outline where exactly you find your cleavage plane, the best location to find it? Uh, to, the, to the nerves? Yes. Uh, I, I, as Sebastian said, at the, at the internal auditory canal, this is the best way uh, to find it because the anatomy is preserved. The anatomy of the facial nerve and cochlear nerve uh, is better preserved within the internal auditory canal than outside. Outside, you may have some variations. Within the canal, you have almost the same situation because the facial nerve is, is running uh, at the superior and anterior part of the internal auditory canal. So in my opinion, this is the best place. That's the reason, one of the reasons we start uh, the surgery with the internal auditory canal. And then we move to the CP angle. The advantage of schwannoma in comparison to meningioma is that within a schwannoma, you have nothing but tumor. You have no vessel, no nerve, nothing. So you can do your decompression very easily. Only in a very few number of cases, it's less than 1%, you may have the facial nerve running on the back side of the tumor. Uh, this is about 0.5% of the case. But otherwise, you have nothing at the posterior part of the tumor. So you can enter that and make a quick enucleation. And then you will, if you elevate the tumor, you will find first the cochlear nerve, 
and in front of the cochlear nerve, so more uh, anterior to the cochlear nerve, you will see the facial nerve. Mm. I have another question for you. What is the role of intraoperative drainage of CSF, EVD versus lumbar drain? I never use lumbar drain, never use lumbar drain. I think lumbar drain may be uh, risky in some time, in some cases, if you drain too much. Uh, EVD only in cases with uh, uh, severe hydrocephalus, otherwise not. If the patient has some hydrocephalus, but without symptoms, what I do is just open the systems. Then we have enough CSF uh, drain, draining out. If a patient has a severe hydrocephalus and is becoming symptomatic for hydrocephalus and the tumor is huge, I put a VP shunt first and I wait uh, one week, two weeks, and then I do the surgery. So, but these are very extreme cases we don't see very much in Europe. But uh, in other countries, we are confronted with these cases more frequently. I agree. I think what... Sorry, sorry. go ahead, Jan. Go ahead. What, what Marcus uh, explained uh, when, when he was explaining how he's, how he's doing the craniectomy or the craniectomy is that if you go very low um, uh, in, in direction of the forearm magnum and, and then you come flush below the cerebellum. So even if you have a very big tumor, I think it doesn't, it may not hinder you to, to um, attain the, the cisterns. So I think which, which is important is not to go like this, but you have to go very low and flush. And then even with a large tumor, I don't think it should be very difficult. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Excellent point. Yeah, correct. Exactly what I wanted to say for <laughs> the access to the, to the cistern. We all agree. The point that Marcos made, uh, drilling down, is extremely important to have an easy access to the cistern. It's like drilling, uh, starting the drilling of a clinoid between the, the, between the sigmoid sinus and the condyle. You drill here and a little bit, and then you, you have a very easy access to the cistern from down up. Yana, I have a question for you. How do you stimulate and record the knap? So it, it was this uh, small um, ball electrode. So you, 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 you put it um, on the, directly on the cochlear nerve and then you can record the potentials. And actually because you have a direct um, um, access to the nerve, it, it doesn't take a lot of um, averaging time. So you can get a um, valid signal within 10 or 15 seconds. But it's not always possible in, 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 in very large or bigger tumors. It's, 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 it's good for uh, small to medium-sized tumors because you need to have access to the cochlear nerve at the uh, exit of the brainstem. So, and, but usually in, 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 in large tumors, as the hearing level is, the preoperative hearing status is, uh, is, is low, Sometimes yes, it's 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 uh, it's not really uh, useful. I think to 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 have a very um, uh, uh, on-time auditory monitoring. So uh, so this uh, monitoring with the ball electrode is 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 well suited for the small and medium-sized tumors because this is where you want to preserve function. Mm -hmm. May I ask you something? Uh, how do you keep the electrode in place? Because Sometimes I fight with this uh, small ball. It's always running out of my position. How? how yeah, do yeah. We, 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 we took a bit of surgicel and, 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 and uh, wet surgicel and, and, and put it slightly um, and covered the, 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 the electrode and the nerve. And what another point is that we try to avoid uh, to have some uh, contact with the, with the blade so we want to have the um, the electrode coming out out of our surgical axis so that you don't get into the electrode every time you enter an instrument into the corridor. Uh, sometimes we have to fight with this. Uh, yes. This technique is very beautiful. What I have seen is there are some cases the patients have hearing but the usual auditory evoked potential is zero. 
And, uh, and when we use the direct electrode, we get waves. Otherwise, we have, in some particular cases, nothing. And so uh, the only way to record some waves is sometimes uh, the direct uh, recording. Very nice. Maybe a final comment for a few minutes also. The, the mobility starts uh, directly when we are performing the craniotomy. And I see in all your image, just one bur all, and then the craniotomy is used. I must admit that I, I am always afraid with such technique, with the craniotome just close to the sinus. Uh, and I expect that all residents making the opening will have also some stress to have severe bleeding. And I look a little to the literature, the rate of major bleeding that has been published recently in operative neurosurgery on a large series of 450 patients reported 2.9% of major bleeding after sinus opening. And we are also aware of uh, thrombosis complication at the end of the surgery and in the follow-up of patients, and it is quite usual as well, 6% of the patient could have a sinus thrombosis after the surgery, with few patients having a clinical expression of this complication, but uh, the complication and the mobility rate can increase even at the beginning. And regarding the thrombosis rate, putting hemostatic agent, bone wax, very severely can compress the sinus and be responsible for that. So when I open and I do a retrosigmoid craniotomy, I have another technique, which is what I call over the sinus drilling technique, meaning that I drill truly over the sinus, leaving just a small piece of bone that I break with the spatula, and then I remove it with a carinson. And the craniotomy is only used over the dura covering the cerebral uh, hemisphere. And so, what is your opinion about this? Have you already expected and seen some complications? Just, Marcos, I've seen you have also published the experience of your residents you teach. Yes. Uh, it's an extremely good and important point. I'm always teaching <laughs> this issue. Um, absolutely correct, you what you have said. We must, uh, we, we divide the patients in, in this department. Patients older than 50, they receive craniectomies because usually in older patients, so we make a cutoff uh, with the age of 50. Patients over 50 or something like that, we do craniectomy, craniectomies to avoid dura and sinus lacerations. Mm -hmm. It's not worth it. And then we do craniectomy and uh, we put acrylic or titan mesh to cover this area. If the patient is young, we use craniotomy. But then we put the first bow hole close to the asterion, or if somebody is using navigator, can use navigator to assess the, the, the knee of the sinus. That means the area where the transverse sinus is coming to the sigmoid. And then what you mentioned is extremely important to find first where the sinus, the sigmoid sinus is running. Mm -hmm. And first of all, to see where the sinus is running and then to perform the craniotomy. Otherwise, the craniotomy will be too far away from the sinus or will damage the sinus. So both we don't like to have. And, and, uh, and then I teach the residents to see first where the sigmoid sinus is running, and then they start the craniotomy far away from the sinus, and the last part is the part uh, closer to the sinus, but never over the sinus, always a little bit far away from the sinus. Um, we have not seen um, uh, major sinus uh, lacerations using that technique, but the emissary vein may be uh, cut using the craniotomy. We have to identify the, if there is a very large emissary vein, then we don't use craniotomy, we do craniectomy. You know? And uh, this is a very important point. If, if there is opening 
of the sigmoid sinus, um, I try to teach my people never put gel form, never put tacosil. Uh, if the patient's in sitting position, do immediately jugular compression to have blood coming outside. The sinus must bleed. It's better to have a bleeding than to have a thrombosis. And in my opinion, the best way to close the sinus is to put muscle over this area and fibrin glue surrounding. So the muscle will, will make the new uh, 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 wall of the sinus. And I put fibrin glue surrounding this muscle and then a cotonoid above. And after surgery, the patients receive a CT scan with phlebography to see whether the sinus is thrombosed or not. If there is any signs of thrombosis, we start with uh, heparinization very early on these cases. I, I don't know in our cases uh, the, the, the rate of sinus thrombosis. I, I must uh, make, bring this calculation another time but we do have cases with sinus thrombosis, um, however, without consequences for the patient. I remember one case we had uh, cerebral bleeding because of major sinus thrombosis. So one case we have had, this patient had trouble with that because of, uh, of uh, venous uh, congestion and cerebral bleeding because the dominant sinus was uh, thrombosed. So one case we have had, otherwise I don't remember other cases. These uh, on, on, uh, among 1,500 patients. Time is running fast and fastly, especially when it is interesting. So I would like to give you the opportunity, Jan, Marcos and Sebastian, if you have a very short word for ending the session. Jan, if you want. A few yes. Words. So th thank you very much uh, to uh, all the three of you to moderating and contributing very interestingly to our discussion. And I hope that uh, the, the attendees and the residents also spend a nice time and that uh, the numbers uh, will, will, will go up the next webinars that we are going to have all together. Please, Marcus. Yeah, look, uh, to all residents uh, who are watching us, you did the first good step, uh, listening this seminar. And the second step would be to visit all these giants you are uh, seeing here, visit them, see how they are doing that. So is it the best way uh, to learn this technique? Sebastian? It was very nice. It was a very nice discussion. We, I think we learned a lot, tip and tricks. It was a very nice uh, discussion after the lectures. No, let's, uh, let's do it uh, again uh, soon because it's very interesting. Schwannoma surgery, as I said, is a very demanding surgery and, uh, and you need to be sure of what you are going to do uh, when you start with a schwannoma. Starting with resecting is a, a convexity meningioma or skull-based meningioma is not the same than starting to resect a large schwannoma. The schwannoma, schwannoma surgery will not forgive you mistakes. So definitely it's, uh, it's something we, we have to learn, keep learning, keep trying improving and watching uh, Marcos uh, uh, and Jan doing it is, uh, is extremely important as you said, Marcos. Yes. Uh, Thank I you, Michael, for organizing it. I will have the same message. Uh, visit the masters. It's truly important. I visited Hanover and I was impressed. I, I learned many things at that time uh, when seeing vestibular, vestibular schwannoma surgeries. I will visit you, Marcos, in Turingen, definitely. I have had the opportunity to work with Jan and Sebastian in La Riboisière with Bernard Georges. It was a very nice time with you. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you have demonstrated how you master at uh, such very difficult procedure. And uh, I hope to see you for the next webinar organized by the ENS and also especially by the school-based section. 
which will be organized on the 7th October. And we keep in touch. Stay safe in the meantime. Thank you. Bye to all of you. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care. All the best. Bye-bye.